Good morning and welcome everyone to Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church and to our Sunday school lesson this week. Of course, we're still in Genesis. We're uh, looking at chapters 27, 28, and 29 today, talking about Esau and Jacob. A lot of text to go over in this. We're going to highlight a few of the verses along the way. But it, it mentions here, Isaac and Rebekah began their life together in faithful obedience to God and to Abraham. However, as time went by, they turned to scheming as the way to get what they wanted. The result was that their family fell to pieces. A good beginning does not guarantee a happy ending. Each member of this family was willing to disregard God's will and his direct teaching in order to get what he wanted. That should be quite a concern for us, quite a warning to us to pay attention to what we talk about in here today but more particularly pay attention to what's going on in our lives and our seeking of God's will are we uh, are we disregarding his will to get what we want are we trying to add to what he's wanting us to do in order to get what we want rather than God's will but we need to to keep that uh, to think about that because it mentions too however God is sovereign and he can use sinful behavior to accomplish his purposes Many people today still live just as this family did, and the result will be the same. These verses teach us how God deals with our infirmities and how he can use our failures to accomplish his will and advance his kingdom. So again, it, it really doesn't matter what our desire is and what we want. God's going to get what God wants, bottom line. God is sovereign. His uh, it says right here, the student will accept the overriding providence of God. That's our application for our lesson today. We need to understand uh, that if it's God's will uh, and, and he wants us to be a part of it, we need to be prayerfully thankful for that and seek out how we need to accomplish that and not try to work things to our end because, uh, well, we all know about this family and how things went. We're going to look into that a little deeper today. So we're going to begin in Genesis 27. Uh, we've got verses 28 through 30, 41, and then 28, 1 through 4. Therefore God gave thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's son bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone who, that curseth thee and blessed be he that blesseth thee. And it came to pass as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob. And Jacob was yet scarce gone from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand, then I will slay my brother Jacob. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him, and charged him, and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Paddan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multiple of people, and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee, and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham." So we skip through a whole lot of stuff right there and skip through some verses. There's a whole lot going on. You remember back when they were much younger that Esau came in from one day from hunting and Jacob was cooking some soup and Esau was starving to death, he thought. You know, we use that term quite loosely, starving to death. Our dogs are starving to death every day when Stacy gets home, but you know, <laughs> they'll make it just fine. That's kind of the way Esau felt that day. He gave away his birthright to Jacob that day for a cup of soup, for pottage. But then we're talking today about his blessing. The eldest son in this in this time would get the blessing and by getting the blessing then the eldest son they control the wealth of the family they everybody else looked up to them everybody else kind of served them and, and they just ran things and that was just the custom and the culture was to give the blessing to the oldest the oldest son god told isaac and he told rebecca early on 
the, the second son would be the one that would get this blessing. That the second son would be the one that would carry on the covenant that God made with Abraham. That the second son, which is Jacob, would be the third generation to carry on this covenant with God. Now, God exp expressed to them when they were born that, that that's his will. That that's what it's so, you know, that should have been it. There shouldn't have been any other thing along the way, but Rebecca loved Jacob the most and showed it. Isaac loved Esau the most and he showed it, which in and of itself is bad. And so they started scheming, trying to figure out Isaac to figure out how he could, you know, Esau could get the blessing of the covenant and Rebecca trying to figure out how Jacob's going to keep it. And they thought they had to meddle with that and get involved and, and be a part of it. But, and so when he got this blessing here that we talked about in, in verse 28, this is when Jacob went in and deceived Isaac. Isaac was old. He was blind. They say he was old and blind, and, and, but he lived another 20 years past this. I mean, he was old, but so he goes in and his mother, Isaac asked Esau to go out. I mean, he was acting like he was on his deathbed to go out and kill some game and bring it back in and cook him up just like he can't and he does and, and he, that was his favorite meal. So he goes out to go hunting. Rebecca knows what's going on. She overheard Abraham, I mean, excuse me, Isaac, saying what he was wanting to do and that he was going to eat that meal and then he was going to bless Esau. So she schemed up a plan and she had him go out and kill two goats and she cooked it up just like Isaac likes. Gave it to Jacob, told him, you go in. And, and when he went in, he told his mother, and he said, well, he's going to know it's not me because if you remember, Esau is a hairy individual and Jacob is not. And of course, their voices are going to be a bit different as well. Could be similar, but, but they're still going to be a little different. And so she covered that by taking the skin of the goats and putting it on his hands and putting it on his neck so that when his dad hugged on him, he would feel the hairiness and know that that's who he was. And I know that sounds a little far-fetched, but hey, he's an older fella and can't see, so we'll fool him with a little bit. So he goes in there and he knows it doesn't sound like Jake, I mean, like, it doesn't sound like I... Esau, all these names, it's, just, it's tough to keep them all straight. And so he takes the food, he enjoys it, he says, come here, and he hugs on him, and he, he says, you don't sound like him, but she also put Esau's clothes on him, he said, but you smell like him, you know, you smell like, you know what it smells like when you've been outside, and he, and he feels like it, so he gave the blessing that he had reserved for Esau, he gave it to Jacob. Again, he was trying to scheme things and he was trying to do things his own way and God's providence is going to win out. And he's doing exactly what God intended to be done. The blessing goes to Jacob. And then Esau comes in. Just as soon as Jacob leaves the tent, Esau comes in with, with the game he killed and then he throws a fit because he's figured out what's happened. Isaac throws a fit because he's figured out what's happened. And Esau even added in there that he stole not only my blessing, but he also stole my birthright. Well, that's not true either. Esau gave up his birthright. So you see people, you know, when things don't go their way, they start making things up. They start forgetting exactly how things happened. They start making excuses. And not only had he done that, but his parents... You know, uh, they didn't, Isaac and Rebecca didn't want these boys married someone of that area, of that land that they were living in. They wanted them to do the same as, as uh, Isaac had done with Rebecca and go back to their homeland for a while. Well, Esau had married two women from that area. He had married two Canaanite women, so he wasn't exactly following along with his mother and father's will. And, and it mentions in our text here, did they, we can only wonder what Rebecca and Jacob thought would happen after the blessing was given to Jacob. Did they expect Isaac to enjoy being deceived? Did they expect Esau to agree with them? 
Esau had previously sold his birthright, so he was not an innocent victim. When we practice deception instead of faith in God, we weave a horrible web of hatred and broken hearts. This is not a description of a happy home. You know, we talk about dysfunctional families today. They've, there's been dysfunctional families for thousands of years, and this is a good example of one right here. But they're practicing deception instead of faith in God. They were trying to deceive each other instead of trusting that God will work things out. And God's going to work things out whether they were doing it in an honest manner or not. <clears throat> so Esau is much upset. Isaac's upset. Esau swears he's going to kill his brother. Rebecca hears this and she's fearful for Jacob's life as well should be. So they content she she starts laying another plan. It mentions there in text that Isaac realized the danger of the situation. He realized the danger of the situation after Rebecca went and put a bug in his ear. That's what, you know, it was her idea and her thought that a good way to get Jacob out of, out of Esau's eyesight and out of his reach is to send him back to my home where I came from, send him back to my, bro to my brother's home and let him live there. And you remember that was about a 900 mile round trip, so that's a long ways away. We'll send him back there and, and uh, he should be safe and then Esau can cool off while he's gone. <coughs> so they agreed to that. Jacob hits the road, starts uh, on the trip back home to their homeland. And then we pick up in Genesis 28, 13 through 15. And then 19 to 22. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereupon thou liest. To thee I will give it, and to thee thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of this earth, and shall be spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest. And will bring thee again unto this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat, and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And all of thou shalt give me, I surely will give tenth unto thee. So he's on his third night out on this trip. He lies down, puts a rock under his head for a pillow and goes to sleep. And he has this vision of God. God comes and visits to him. This is the Jacob's Ladder vision that you're probably familiar with. Where he sees this ladder with the angels going to and fro from the earth to heaven. But what God's doing here is he's reaffirming the covenant to Jacob that he made with his grandfather, Abraham. He's letting Jacob know that not only did your father give this blessing to you, but I'm reaffirming that this blessing of this covenant is between you and I. He's the third generation, and, and he's explaining this to him. It mentions in our text, here Jacob learned the truth of Ephesians 2.10, that God had a plan for his life. Accepting this truth is life-changing. If we believe that God has a plan for us, then life becomes an exciting adventure as that plan unfolds day by day. No event is ordinary. Life can never be meaningless if we are living out the divine plan of God. So all of them have made a mess of their family, but God's still not through with them. We make a mess of our lives pretty much on a regular basis, but that doesn't mean God's through with us because he's not through with us if we know Jesus as our Savior. That's why we're here, because God's not through with us. That's why we're still walking this earth. He still has a plan for us. He still has something for us to do. So he's letting Jacob know that this covenant extends through him and then to his descendants. You remember his grandfather, Abraham, didn't just 
immediately have a dream and a vision of God and all of a sudden he's this great strong man of faith and, and willing to do everything that God tells him to do. Nor did his father. Both of them, Isaac and Abraham, had to grow in spiritual maturity throughout their life. And, and I've read a couple of different things in commentaries about these verses, particularly 20 through 22. But God, this covenant is, is between God and, and Abraham's family, but it's a one-way thing. You remember, it's a one-way street. God's the only one that has a responsibility in this. But these gentlemen, these men, have to walk in faith. But God also understands that they, they have to grow in this faith. And you see it says, Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I can come again to my father's house, then shall the Lord be my God. I read commentaries both ways, but what I saw most was this is Jacob almost saying like, well, I'll give this a try. If God will do this, and if God will do that, and if God will do this, then he'll be my Lord. Well, that's really not so far from what the other, what his father and his grandfather had done. And of course, that's, that's not right. But it's amazing that God <clears throat> has the understanding and forgiveness to let us say something such as this. I mean, this is not a prosperity gospel. And that's almost what it sounds like he's saying here. You know, if, as long as you're going to take care of me and if I see all this turns out well for me, then, yeah, you're my Lord. You're, you're my God. Well, that's... But this is God's will. This is God's covenant with this family, with this lineage of men. And God is such a forgiving God that he lets him say these things and lets him think these things and lets him take time to learn and to grow. Aren't you so thankful that he does that with us as well? Because we don't say it in the same words that Jacob says it here. But yeah, it's in our mind. We think it. We, I mean, how many times has somebody said, Lord, if you will just please get me out of this situation, I'll do this. I mean, it's, I mean, that's, that's human nature sadly, but I mean we all do that. You know, and typically we do that in a time that we should have turned to God first and he'd have probably kept us out of that situation and we wouldn't have to be begging for help at that point. But that's along the lines of what we'll talk about here in a minute. That's sinning and knowing that you're going to reap after you sin. It doesn't matter what you sow. Whether you're sowing good things or you're sowing bad things, there will be a harvest, regardless. And that's what we see here. But Jacob, he's on the right path. He's starting to grow. He's starting to understand that God has a plan for his life. And, and then again, it took a long time to get where he was going. Uh, and then he's going to see too often when we decide to turn over a new leaf and we're going to do the right thing, that doesn't mean that everybody around us has turned over a new leaf as well and that everybody around us understands things in the same manner we do. That everybody around us is seeking God's will in the same manner and pace that we are. He's fixing to find out that things don't necessarily turn out that way. But... Uh, Anyway, we pick up with Genesis 25 through 30. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is thou has done unto me? Did I not serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? And Laban said, it must be, it must be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week and will give thee this also for service, which thou shalt serve me yet seven other years and Jacob did so and fulfilled her week and he gave him Rachel his daughter to, to wife also and Laban gave to Rachel his daughter Bilhah his handmaid to be her maid and he went in also unto Rachel and he loved also Rachel more than Leah and served him yet another seven years so Jacob gets to the homeland 
he gets to his mother's home. And, and he's out there at the well with the capstone, and it's kind of interesting to read about that. The, they couldn't take the capstone off until all the herbs got there, particularly because I was reading it. It's, uh, the younger uh, herdsmen and, and, and all, they, they couldn't necessarily move that, but Jacob was able to move the capstone just by himself. That's why they had to get the whole crowd there. But Rachel was a shepherd and she took care of her father's flocks and he saw her, they told him who she was. He kissed her on the cheek, the customary greeting, and told her who he was and she gets excited. She runs back, tells her dad, and he comes out to meet his nephew. And so they, uh, he wants to stay there and <coughs> Laban doesn't want him to stay there and not get paid and you know, he wants wages and he wants to give him something for his work. And he says, I tell you what, if you'll give me Rachel to be my wife, I'll work for you for seven years. That was such a large dowry to offer up seven years. It was, it was kind of like an offer you can't refuse. Somebody's got something that they don't want to get rid of. You don't go up there and offer them what it's worth. You go up there and offer them something ridiculously above what it's worth. And you get their head to spin in and they can't do anything but say yes. And that's what this offer of seven years servitude to him was for his daughter. So he said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. So he worked seven years and then they had the wedding feast and the, the bride is wears a veil through this whole thing. Rachel is the second daughter. And so she wears a bride, or I mean, she wears, she wears a veil, the bride does. And then Jacob goes into the tent and it's the wedding night and then the father brings the bride over there and takes her to the tent. It's dark in there, you know, they don't have electricity and all those good things. And so apparently she didn't speak to him either all night long because he had no idea it's kind of amazing that the trickster gets tricked huh you remember somebody was in a tent and he got led in there somebody that couldn't see so now we find Jacob in a tent he can't see what's going on and he finds out in the morning that that's not Rachel lying next to him that's Leah lying next to him and so he goes to her father and says what have you done why have you deceived me such as this and he said well it's a customary in our land that the first, the eldest daughter has to be married first. And you can't marry this, the second daughter can't take a husband before the first. And, but I tell you what I'll do, you know, here we go bargain again. I'll give you Rachel to be your wife as well if you'll work for me for seven more years. So, I mean, goodness gracious, this guy, Chris doesn't think a wife's worth that, does he? <laughs> <laughs> You've been working for a lot more years than seven. <laughs> <laughs> but he said fulfill her week her, her honeymoon basically you know you're you're going to be with Leah for a week have your honeymoon and then I'll give you Rachel to be your wife as well and then you work for me for seven years and all will be well so that's what they did and each of the girls also had a handmaid and we've seen it before you got one man, multiple wives, they start having children, somebody's not having children, people get all twisted up and upset. So uh, it's kind of interesting to go and read about the description of Leah and, and her eyes and they took that, I mean, it was just evident that they were saying that Rachel was much more beautiful and all this. So God looked at Leah and gave her, opened her womb and gave her sons. She had four sons. And that still didn't change Jacob's attitude towards Rachel. And then, of course, eventually uh, God opened Rachel's womb and she had uh, Joseph and who was this? Benjamin. Yeah. What was that? Benjamin. Benjamin, that's right. And uh, so, anyway, we got four women, we got 12 sons, and none of those folks get along either. <laughs> they. <laughs> We'll see about those shortly as well. But she eventually had the two sons. The two handmaids had sons. Leah had four sons. It's just amazing to stop and look at 
all these people thought they had to do to accomplish God's will for their lives. When all they have to do is listen to God and follow God. He doesn't need us adding to it. He doesn't need us deceiving people to get to where we need to be. He doesn't need us being concerned that we need to speed things along. His will will be accomplished in his time. I, I used to work with a guy, well, y'all know Virgil most years, but Virgil would always say that it's a, a whole lot easier to tell the truth because you don't have to have near, basically, you don't have to have the memory to remember all those lies, basically, is what he was saying. It's a whole lot easier to do what's right, to do what God's will is, than it is to start deceiving people because as soon as you start deceiving folks, you don't remember what was the truth and what was a lie and what you'd said to this person to get this other person to do this. So, but we find people all through life living that way, doing things like that. And uh, bargaining with God. You know, Mike, one of the things that I've thought about often in this story is that whenever they, whenever he came and got Rebecca and Laban wanted, him to, wanted to keep her for those Daddy, I've often figured that all these years, he's like, when they come back to get the next one, I'm going to get something better out of it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. You know, he's been planning on it. So in a final word, it says, Sin casts long shadows that reach across generations and affect the lives of many innocent people. The actions of Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau touched many lives and brought a great deal of trouble to many people. Jacob was blessed by God and would later have his name changed to Israel, but he scarcely had a happy home. His wives were in an almost constant struggle and his sons behaved more like enemies than brothers. God blessed Jacob, but at the same time, Jacob suffered for the sins he committed. The lesson for us is that when we sin, we do not forfeit the leadership of God. God can use sinners to accomplish his purposes. His divine plan for our lives takes our sin into account. However, the great lesson remains when we sin after we have received knowledge of the truth, the sin must be dealt with. We will reap what we sow and there will never be a crop failure. These men and women were real people who made real choices. They were not forced to deceive each other, but once they did, the result of their actions was inevitable. Likewise, we do not have to sin. In all matters, great or small, we can do what is right and trust God to lead us and to bless us. If we choose to ignore God and sin anyway, we can expect to reap the consequences of the acts we have committed. Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked by our conduct. If we sow to the flesh, we will reap destruction. If we sow to the spirit, we will reap everlasting life. You know, we all understand that we are sinners. And even if you're saved, you continue to be a sinner, saved by grace, but you continue to sin in your life. But it's interesting, you know, we say, no one is perfect. We all know that. And, but it still comes down to making a choice. We always have a choice. We can do what's right, what God's will, or we can do what we want, what makes us what we think is the right thing to do. And that's what he's talking about here. If we sow to the flesh, if we do what we want because that's what we want, because that'll make us happy, and we, we go along and say, well, that's still getting where God wants us to be. God still wants us over there, and I, but we're making our own way there instead of the way God wants us to go there. Or we sow to the Spirit. And if you're following God's will, we can only imagine what blessings he lays aside for us in heaven because of that. And there's always consequences to those sins. There's always going to be a crop harvested. We, you know, God's will was done in this that we're reading about, in this family. But how much easier would it have been on all of them and how much more joyful would it have been for all of them if they had just gone to God every time they had one of these decisions to be made? Of course, we wouldn't be sitting here looking at them and saying, well, there's still a hope for us because 
we're not any worse than these people or we're just as bad as these people or these people are doing the same thing I've done uh, and look what God's done for them, which is true. But he just wants us to, you know, to recognize those choices and to seek his wisdom in making those choices. Uh, with that, I'd like for us to go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning so thankful, so thankful for this opportunity to gather here to study your word. Thankful to know that although we sow to the flesh, you're still a forgiving God. Your grace still extends to us. And you'll still bless us regardless of, of our conduct. I just thank you so much, Lord, to know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, for these failings of, in our lives, so that we can spend an eternity in the presence of the both of you. I just pray, Lord, that you'll continue to, to bless this church, her ministries, the services this morning. I ask a blessing as well, Lord, on our country, a healing with our country, Lord. I just pray that everyone will understand that if we sow to the flesh, we'll reap destruction, Lord. Just, I just my prayer that somehow this country will be led to know to sow to, to your spirit, Lord. I just ask forgiveness where I fail you. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.